This might be the funkiest bass line of the decade, and in this video we're going to go deep into the harmony, the rhythm, and the arrangement to see what makes this song groove so hard. Let's jump into it in one, two, three, four. Oh. The song is called Dean Town and is written by music student Woody Goss, who went on to become a founding member of the band Wolfpack. The song is just a simple four chord loop, and they introduce it by having Joe Dart, the bass player, come out on stage and just play repeated 16th notes outlining the root notes of the chord. I mean, listen to the crowd. This is like a World Cup stadium or something. Musically speaking, this introduction's kind of weird. It's just the root notes played in a great groove, but it works because the audience knows the song and they know what's about to happen. And as great as this recording is, in order for us to go deeper into the theory behind the song, I actually wanna switch us over to a different recording. This recording is actually by an entirely different band called Corey Wong and the Wong Notes, but it's all kind of in the same family. Corey is a really close collaborator with Wolfpack. In fact, that was him you saw playing guitar on stage with them at Madison Square Garden. But this recording takes this song to a whole nother level, adding brass and percussion. Picking up where we left off, we've got Sonny T ripping the same 16th note chord root line that we heard Joe Dart playing earlier. And we've got the horns here that have kind of taken the place of the, <laughs> what do you call it? The vocal line that the audience was singing. So here comes that bass line. Alright, there's a lot for us to break down here, but I think we should take a step back and just look at the chords first, because once we understand the chords, we'll have laid a solid foundation for us to understand the bass line. So the song is based on a four chord loop of F sharp minor, C sharp minor, E, and B. But this song upgrades both of our major chords to be dominant seventh chords, and that just gives us that funky sound that we're after. All of these chords belong to F sharp Dorian, which is basically just E major, but where we've shifted everything over by a note, so the one chord becomes the F sharp chord instead. But it's the same notes as E major. Let's go real slow over the bass line. Let's go chord by chord. Don't get too confused by the rhythm yet. We're gonna come back to the rhythm, but let's look at just the notes for now. On this first chord, there's really nothing crazy going on. All of these notes are diatonic, meaning they all belong to the key of F sharp Dorian. In fact, all of these notes are just part of F sharp minor seven. The only note actually that's outside of that is D sharp, and that's just a passing note anyway. Moving on here to our next chord, C sharp minor. Just like the last line, we're really outlining the chord notes here of C sharp minor. There are a couple other notes in passing in between, but really we're just outlining C sharp minor. That is except for this D sharp at the very end. Now this D sharp is acting as a leading tone that's gonna get us into E, which is our next chord. But actually this illustrates what makes this bass line so great. While the chords are changing strictly every two measures, the phrases of the melody are not two measure phrases. You can tell when Woody composed this line that he cared a lot about the connection between the chords to make sure that the melody carried us from one chord to the next. And he's doing this by carrying the melody over the bar line. He's using passing tones to get us away from the notes of the first chord and move us towards the notes of the second chord. This is something I see my jazz students struggle with all the time when they're trying to improvise. They see one chord and they invent a phrase that lasts for that one chord, and then they take a breath when the chord changes and play another phrase on the next chord. But if you listen to the great jazz soloists, they work a lot on creating melodic lines that carry you across the chords.
as we move into the next chord, which is E, he's really emphasizing an E dominant seventh chord. And you can tell that because of the D natural. Our key of F sharp Dorian should have a D sharp, but he's chosen to use D natural because that creates a secondary dominant relationship with the next chord. If you want to know more about how secondary dominance work, you should check out my Jazz Foundations course. There's a link down below with a discount code. I have an entire chapter on secondary dominance. This bass solo goes through our four chord loop twice. At this point, we've gone through the loop once, and the second half actually does stuff that's very similar to what we just saw in the first half. If you look at the notes of the solo in the second half, you'll see it's very much like the first half, but it's still outlining notes from the scale, emphasizing the chord tones, and focusing on ways to transition from one chord to the next. I especially like this walk up that he does on the E chord, which just kind of shifts the feel towards beat three for a second. It just kind of knocks us off balance. It's really clever. So speaking of rhythm, let's talk about rhythm. The rhythm is what makes this thing groove. This line is built on a funk groove, which means straight 16th notes. That means we take our beat and we subdivide it by four. In a traditional jazz context, we would subdivide in two. We would think about these as eighth notes and we would impart a swing feel. If we were playing a tune like Satin Doll, we would really emphasize that swung eighth note feel. In a swing feel like this, our eighth notes are not subdivided evenly. The first note is long and the second note is short. But in funk, it's all about straight 16th notes. It's like a clock. You've gotta be technically precise. When we're playing swing music, we can get away with being a little bit looser with the rhythm, but not so in funk. You've gotta be dead on in the pocket, otherwise this groove just doesn't feel right. So pulling the bass line back up and you'll see these are full of 16th note phrases. And I want you to notice that these phrases often start off the beat. Let's draw in some lines to show where the pulse would be. And you'll see that a lot of our lines start in between the pulses. Some of them are on the beat, but others are in between. This mix of on the beat versus off the beat is called syncopation. And syncopation is what makes you wanna get up on your feet and dance. If you play on the beat too much, or if you play off the beat too much, you become kind of square and boring and monotonous. But when you mix these things up, you'll find that your toe starts tapping without you even realizing it. At this point, they repeat the bass line exactly the same way they just played it, but they double it in the keyboard and in the guitar. It's already a hip AF bass line, but when you add the timbres from the keyboard and the guitar, it just makes it sound fresh. Not to mention, it's just kind of thrilling to watch these three players who are all at the top of their game play the same line together in unison perfectly. Another thing they do to keep this sounding fresh is they have the horn lines come in and punctuate the key moments of the solo. And they have some really fun moments in the horns here, like this stacking of fourths thing that they just did. At this point, we've put the bass line aside for a second, and we're just going to live in the groove for a minute. In the back of the room, we've added congas and bongos, which you almost can't hear, but you can definitely feel. The bass has gone back to this repeated 16th notes just on the root of the chords. And then the guitar comes in with these syncopated chord movements. And can we just say for a second, Corey Wong is like one of the best rhythm guitar players I have ever seen. He is just so freaking tight. And now this builds again, adding another syncopated loop in the horns. Can we just talk about how perfectly arranged all of this is? Everybody has exactly their part to play. Everything here has been prescribed perfectly. You've got the drum groove in the back. You've got Sunny T playing these 16th notes. You've got Corey Wong doing his rhythm guitar movement thing. Now you've got the horn lines coming in with this. You've got the keyboards and the pads on the back. And none of them are playing at the same time. All of these parts have been thought out ahead of time and composed to give you this sound. Whoever wrote that horn line deserves a raise. This is not part of Woody Goss's original tune. This is not something we would ever hear Wolfpack play. This is something that was added specifically for this band. And I gotta say, those horns add so much. 
Let's be real here. This song is not really a song. It's just an amazing groove with an incredible bass line. And you just want to hear it on repeat because it's just that good. But in terms of like song form and structure, it's not that interesting. So I kind of appreciate what they did with the horn line here, which is to try and give it some new material. Give it a shout chorus kind of effect, right? Okay, so at this point, they're just showing off. You've got, what, six horns. You've got the bass, the guitar, the keyboards. That's nine people playing this line in unison. It's just fun to watch. And man, it's just technical wizardry. Honestly, it's so tight, it sounds like one person is playing all the parts. 